Good morning, everyone. Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's TLN presentation. My name is Chris Padilla, and I work for the Transportation Learning Network. Today's presentation, Optimization of Pavement Marking Performance, is brought to you by the Transportation Learning Network. TLN is a program of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University and is a partnership with the four state DOTs of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming and the Mountain Plains Consortium, which includes eight universities in Colorado, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Today's presentation, again, is MPC Research, Optimization of Pavement Marking Performance. This presentation will cover research conducted by South Dakota State University under the Mountain Plains Consortium and with additional funding from South Dakota Department of Transportation. Pavement marking retroreflectivity is achieved by using various materials on PCC and asphalt pavements. This study examined if snow plowing and winter maintenance affected the performance and durability of various pavement marking materials. This study also evaluated the constructability, durability, and visibility of alternate alternative pavement marking materials. Researchers studied seven pavement marking test sections on highways in different regions of South Dakota. There are various parameters that was used and a, a lot of data that was uh, included and collected. Our speaker today is Dr. Alan Jones. He is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at South Dakota State University, and he has been at South Dakota State University for 16 years. Prior to that, he was a senior engineer at Hart Krauser Incorporated for 15 years as an engineering consulting firm in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Jones received his PhD in civil engineering from the University of Washington and his MS and BS from the University of Idaho. With that, Dr. Jones, I'll turn it over to you to begin your presentation. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Welcome, everyone, to the webinar. Um, as I work through uh, the research project, I certainly encourage questions, so don't be afraid to chime in and ask a question, and I'm happy to answer those at the end as well. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, I'm Alan Jones, and I'd like to give you the background on this project, uh, the objectives, and then uh, the field data that we collected and how we collected. Uh, the data through the uh, parameters and the marking combinations that we use and then the test sites and those measurements and then how we analyze the data um, to evaluate performance and I guess I would warn you up front uh, in evaluating performance that means different things to different people and so I'll put it in the context of how we did it for this and then how uh, cost analysis can be performed because I think in the end it, it all relates back to cost and then conclusions and recommendations that came from this study. I want to first thank you the project sponsors, the Mountain Plains Consortium and the South Dakota Department of Transportation were uh, major funders of this project and then also South Dakota State University through some in-kind contributions. I'd also like to thank uh, the student researchers, Thomas Drivestein, who did the bulk of this work, who is now with the South Dakota Department of Transportation and Road Design, and then Kofi Apong, who is now at Iowa State University getting his PhD. And then, of course, I have uh, Dr. Nadine Webby listed as the project investigator. He was also the principal investigator for this project, and he played a key role in, in uh, seeing this project through to com uh, completion. Uh, as Chris mentioned, um, I've spent most of my time in engineering practice and have been at South Dakota State for 16 years now, so I like to think I bring a practical and applied aspect to these research projects, and I think that's what we did here. This was not a basic research project. It was uh, meant to be very applied that the South Dakota DOT and Upper Plains DOTs could take this information and use it uh, from the get-go. So if you'd like more information about me, there's the link to uh, uh, my site at SD State, and you can download my Vita um, if you want the details. And so the background and pavement markings are obviously for safety, to convey information to the driver, and that's to either channel or guide traffic flow and then provide traffic separation. And so they need to be adequately visible in day, night, uh, and in adverse weather. And so the day is fairly obvious. The night is where these reflective elements come into play and uh, in adverse weather. We did not assess 
uh, retro reflectivity during adverse weather, um, and you'll see how we collected that data. Here are two uh, macro photographs of of the uh, materials that are added to the paint. On the left are the glass spheres that are pretty much uh, exclusively used in paving markings right now. I did not put pictures of paint up. I think everyone knows what that is. And then the uh, inlay photo on the left shows how those uh, glass beads are embedded in the paint. And then on the right, I'm showing wet reflective elements, and uh, the South Dakota DOT wanted to evaluate those as part of this project. They're a proprietary product, and you can see how they're laid into the paint product um, in the upper left of that. Here's a microscopic view of that, what's called a wet reflective element, the WRE, and it's comprised of many small spheres that are embedded in that product. And so the manufacturer uh, of that um, is 3M. And so, the, again, the DOT wanted to uh, take a look at those as part of this project. Here's the basics behind retroreflectivity, the 30-meter geometry. The idea is that light from vehicles shine forward, enter the glass bead that is now above the uh, level of the paint. It's refracted and then reflected and then refracted again back to the driver as uh, retro reflected light and that way the driver can see uh, these materials the uh, uh, visibility is enhanced through that so I'm not going to get uh, deep into the basics of that uh, in terms of retro reflectivity gradation uh, in the upper left, it shows a figure of how retro reflectivity occurs with time. Um, early on in its life, there's an increase in retro reflectivity as the beads are exposed from the paint due to uh, uh, traffic, winter maintenance, all of that. It's a fairly short period, and then it degrades from there during the life of the uh, pavement marking. On the upper right, it shows how uh, retro reflectivity can be abruptly uh, decreased with time due to winter maintenance activities. Um, and I'll show you some data where we did not necessarily see that abrupt change due to winter maintenance activities. Uh, usually for uh, restriping the retro reflectivity threshold, uh, FHWA has some specification that depends on the posted speed limits. There they are for you in white and yellow. I believe they're still current, but I could be wrong on that. This research was conducted uh, several years ago. And for the South Dakota Department of Transportation for white paint, it's at 100, and there's the units of retro reflectivity. Um, Initial cost of putting these materials on the uh, roadway and the durability or functions of the marking material, obviously, and the application rate. And so those are composed of the, uh, the paint materials and then the beads that are added. Coupled with that is the surface preparation method. And for this study, we looked at directly applied to the uh, pavement. And then we also look at inlaid. So it was grooved prior to placing the pavement marking and then winter maintenance. And I'd like to pause for a minute and talk about winter maintenance. Uh, it's a, the effect of winter maintenance on various things on pavements is a, I found to be a difficult thing to quantify because there's so many variables associated with winter maintenance and that includes weather, the type of winter maintenance, the type of uh, chemicals that are applied to the roadway, I'm also working on a chip seal study for the South Dakota Department of Transportation, and that's obviously the durability of chip seals is also connected to winter maintenance. And uh, so as far as this study goes, we initially looked at trying to somehow correlate this to something quantitatively with winter maintenance, uh, whether it be weather or some indicator. Um, I know our DOT is collecting a lot of quantitative data associated with that. Uh, but you'll see at the end how we ended up including that. Um, and so for this study, we needed to optimize pavement marking for cost and performance. So the objectives of this were to evaluate constructability, durability, and visibility of waterborne paint alternatives on asphalt uh, surfaces and then compare that constructability, durability, and visibility of waterborne paint alternatives 
to inlaid epoxy paint applications on concrete pavements and then assess the cost effectiveness of those marking alternatives for use on the two pavement types, which is concrete and asphalt uh, pavements. Uh, the uh, uh, materials that we use in the field, uh, the parameters was first paint type, and we focused on uh, three main type uh, paints, the waterborne type two, which we refer to as the state specs, because that's the South Dakota DOT, there's a waterborne type three high build, and that's just a greater thickness and, uh, that results in a higher adhesion, but it is considered a type three. And then we considered a, a, a epoxy uh, material that's slow dry, and it's referred to as a type two epoxy here because there are other types. In regards to uh, paint thicknesses, we looked at 15, 17, 20, and 25 mils. These are wet applied thicknesses because that's what's measured uh, in the field for both, I would say, performance and for payment from the contractor. And then, of course, we looked at both white and yellow paints. And then the reflective elements that we looked at were four main types. And then, again, the wet reflective elements were included uh, to see um, if they were worth using in the future. So the uh, reflective elements we used, the Ashto M247 Type 1, uh, and then an Iowa DOT spec, which we called the Iowa Blend, and then the South Dakota Department of Transportation Mega Blend, and the gradations and specifications for these are included in the report if you want the specifics. Then we used what was called a P40 gradation, and those were obviously selected in conjunction with the uh, South Dakota DOT. And then again, the wet reflective elements uh, was included to see its effectiveness on wet pavements. We looked at edge lines and skip lines, and then, of course, the two main pavement types of uh, asphalt concrete, which I'll refer to as AC, and then Portland cement concrete as PCC. Uh, and then those were looked at uh, on both the interstate highway system and the uh, U.S. highway system on, on uh, roads in South Dakota. And then again, we looked at two pavement preparation techniques, the surface applied on both AC and PCC, and then inlaid recessed uh, preparation for both AC and PCC. So those were grooved prior to that. And then in terms of winter maintenance, after I would say a significant amount of, of effort in literature searching and meeting with the DOT um, and trying to tackle how are we gonna, how will we correlate it to winter maintenance, it came down to uh, regions within the state, and those were the dry freeze and the wet freeze regions within the state, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And so when you look at all the parametric combinations for this study, there were 69 uh, test sections in combination of all of those that we looked at. Um, here's the comments on wet freeze and dry freeze, and this comes from the LTTP climate zones. And this map, uh, in terms of South Dakota, shows the demarcation between dry freeze and wet freeze uh, between South Dakota and Minnesota. Uh, the dry freeze regions are areas that undergo a number of freeze-thaw cycles annually in which there's little precipitation. And the wet freeze are uh, cycles where there is precipitation during the winter. For this study, uh, and talking with the DOT, uh, the SDDOT considers that demarcation to be somewhere more central to South Dakota. And so that's how we handle the winter maintenance uh, for all of its advantages and disadvantages. And so you'll see that when I break up the data, how that was handled. Um, in regards to, we had to choose whether we would test these materials using test decks or test sections. And for test decks, what they are is just a concentrated area where all the parametric combinations are applied. And so the advantage being is that there's extensive testing of these products and combinations in that area, and there's much better experimental control. The disadvantage being is usually, or in most cases, those materials have to be applied under separate contract and it's a separate cost. Given the extensive parametric combinations that we used, uh, in conjunction, obviously, with working with the South Dakota DOT, um, we ended up using test sections to piggyback this study on actual 
uh, pavement marking maintenance projects for them. And so the advantages of using that is obviously the lower cost because when we initially started to cost out test decks, it was going to get really expensive in a hurry. The other thing is we wanted good geographic representation and separation so that we could uh, look at the effects of winter maintenance and regions within the state. And then that allowed us to focus on evaluating external impact factors, mostly being uh, winter maintenance. And then that also allowed uh, the DOT to develop state or regional calibration factors as far as a retro reflectivity degradation and expected lifetime of pavement markings. And, and I'm going to talk about that in the future. And then it also allowed us to evaluate inlay technology over longer distances uh, instead of using test decks. And so again, we use test sections in this study. Here are the test areas that we used in the state. Uh, there were seven areas. Um, number one was uh, US Highway 212 in Redfield. Uh, two was in Aberdeen. And then six was on US 14 in DeSmet. And then seven was on the interstate highway system near Brookings. Those are considered uh, one winter maintenance region. And then uh, three, four, and five, three was US 14, four was US 18, and then five was on the interstate system again in Presho, and that's in uh, another winter maintenance region. So you can see if you draw a line north and south between one and five, those were the two regions that we wanted to focus on here. And so the uh, uh, pavement marking maintenance projects for the uh, DOT were identified. And then um, that's where we took our measurements when they were doing that. In regards to the type of materials that were applied uh, for waterborne pain in dry freeze regions, again, that was US 212 and Redford, uh, Redfield and Aberdeen on both AC and PCC services. For waterborne paint wet freeze regions uh, in uh, US 14 and 18, both asphalt and PCC surface applied markings. And then on the interstate system in Presho, that was asf asphalt concrete inlay. Um, and then we did do one PCC section of inlay yellow. And then for epoxy paint, um, that was only in uh, the dry freeze regions, US 14 to Smet, and that was uh, uh, PCC inlay. And then on the interstate system, it was PCC inlay and surface applied markings. And then uh, the project intention was to do long-term measuring. And that was up to 24, if I remember correctly, to 28 months. And so those measurements were conducted monthly in the first year and then every four months in the second year. Obviously, retro, retro rec reflectivity was measured and we used a portable uh, measurement device for that. We took three readings of four locations and those were averaged. And then for the wet reflective elements, we took water out and we did wet and dry readings on those to see the effect of uh, retro reflectivity. We also did a visual rating on a scale of 1 to 10 on the percent marking remaining. We had some hopes that mu that might be a good correlator to uh, marking um, survivability or lifetime. And so we did that at four locations and averaged those. We took both uh, long range and macro photography at each location. And I'll show you some pictures of that. We used a chromometer to measure color. And then we measured dry paint thicknesses. And we did that with metal plate samples that we took when all of the markings were applied. And so we bought a special micrometer uh, that allowed us to do that even with the reflective elements embedded in the paint. Uh, for, for reflective element density, we took one inch macro high resolution photography, and I'll show you some of that. And then other observations we made was just general pavement condition, temperature. And then in all studies like this, where I would say the both the regional and amount of, of sites that we had, there are bound to be some issues that crop up. And, and I have to give our state DOT uh, a tremendous thank you in coordinating all of these. They did a stellar job, but sometimes we showed up and the 
the test areas had been restriped, uh, chip seals had been installed, and so we did lose a few of our sites. But um, you know, in hindsight, uh, maybe there's some things we could have done about that, but um, it was no fault of anyone for that. Uh, the next slide shows in the upper photograph how the metal plates were collected. And so those were uh, laid down when they were actively applying the pavement marking materials so we could allow those to cure and bring them back uh, to uh, SDSU to make those measurements when it had fully cured. The bottom photo shows uh, what I would consider a very standard portable instrument to measure retro reflectivity. Um, it's a quantitative measure of nighttime visibility. And so if you're interested in the specifics of that, it's in the report. Uh, here's what we use for visual rating. Uh, it's a daytime qualitative assessment. And on the right, it shows a graphic. A number 10 is 100% of the paving mark, pavement marking is still on the roadway surface. And then a 1, about 10% remains. And on the left-hand side, it shows comparative photographs of what that pavement marking looks like with time from about six months to just after 20 months. And so you can see uh, how that material loses it as adhesion or, or through winter maintenance or through travel of, of automobiles and trucks on that, how it eventually um, uh, is worn down. Here's how we took the photography. Uh, it is a macro photograph. And so we built a template so that we would take the same photograph every single time when we took our field measurements. And so I have a gazillion photographs, uh, high resolution photographs, and, and they've been archived right now, but um, there's been some studies on there on how that macro photography could be uh, analyzed for correlation to retro reflectivity, durability, and things like that. Um, so we took these, we looked at them, um, but much beyond that, we didn't do too much with them. I'll show you one of them later in the presentation. So here's the general uh, scheme for collecting that information. We took one high-resolution photograph uh, for retro reflectivity that was taken over about 10 to 12 feet, and the visual rating was averaged over about 15 feet of the marking, both for yellow and white. Here's the model that we use to analyze the data. It's a simple uh, exponential decay model where the decay is estimated by uh, A times E to the minus BT. So A is the initial reading, and then B is the decay coefficient that's used to correlate uh, retro reflectivity to age of the pavement. And then, so there, here, this is just an example that shows what R is equal to down below in terms of retro reflectivity. Uh, obviously, there was vigorous discussion on how to analyze the data, but we need to look at the ultimate goal of this, and, and one of it is coming up with decay models so we can estimate uh, the life of these pavement materials, which we considered as a, a good indicator of durability. And so, some, some notes on R squared, right? It, it has its inherent advantages and disadvantages, and out, those are all well documented. Now, if the, uh, in the example here, it shows an R squared of 0.88. Um, that can be good and bad, but if the R squared value is low, time is still a statistically significant predictor of retro reflectivity of the pavement marking, and we can still draw important conclusions about how changes in time are associated with retro reflectivity, and that's the pavement uh, marking life. So therefore, regardless of what the R squared value is, the, the uh, significant coefficients still represent an important change in the response for one unit of time for these. So obviously, this type of information can be extremely valuable in deciding what uh, marking combination to use. However, in the final analysis, recognizing some of the disadvantages of R squared engineering judgment, I think, is an important part in ultimately specify, specifying pavement marking materials. So in terms of uh, data analysis, 
uh, this is the first, so I'll show you a series of, of slides coming up where essentially it's the, the correlation of retroreflectivity to time. And I think it's important to show those so that you understand uh, some of the successes and some of the limitations on this correlation. However, this first slide shows, we we're hoping to use a visual rating, obviously, because then you don't need special equipment. You can train people to, uh, just about anybody to do it. And so what this shows is ref, uh, retroreflectivity versus that visual rating. And um, it shows uh, type 1 and type 2 uh, waterborne paints, um, white edge line on AC for all of them. And then they're all comparing the M247 with the P40. And it, it turns out that uh, the correlation with visual rating, it, it's not a very good indicator of that. And so you can see 25 cases with R squared below a half and five cases above 0.7. And uh, so that was uh, pretty much concluded that that didn't work out as well as we had thought. And maybe in hindsight, that's obvious. But um, so here's this one. So here's, here are the correlations. Here's the bulk of that information. And, and the first is the effect of waterborne paint type, and that's the type 2 versus the type 3. And so in these series of slides, if you look on the vertical axis is retroreflectivity, the horizontal axis is age. And then on, the, on that, it will indicate where. In this case, it was Redfield. And then this is comparing two types of uh, reflective elements, the M247 and the P40. And then if you look up at the plot itself, in all of these, the red circle shows the approximate initial value of retroreflectivity when it's applied. And then the blue circles show where the decay of the retroreflectivity hit a value of 100. The reason being is that's what the South Dakota DOT uses, and so we wanted to point that out um, relative to this study. And then there's a legend in each one depending on what it's comparing. And so for this, it's the type 3 and the type 2. And then the other thing that's important in, in these uh, uh, graphs, uh, the plots, is the uh, time range of data collection. This is a good one. Uh, it's just over 20 months of data collection, and Here's where when we get to the end of this and I show you how some of this data can be used to select pavement marking materials, uh, the length of data collection is something that needs to be included in the engineering ju uh, judgment. And we have it built into the spreadsheet that if there's a, uh, a data collection time range that we feel is pretty short, it will alert you to that in the spreadsheet. Um, the next one is the effect of uh, applied paint thickness of 15 mils versus 17 mils. Uh, this is all white edge line. It's type 2, and it's uh, asphalt concrete in the dry freeze region. And so this is comparing M247 again with P40. And so if you look at that, you can see that the initial retroreflectivity is almost similar, and the decay rates are almost similar as well. On the next one, this is the yellow skip line, type 2 asphalt concrete and dry freeze. Again, a fairly long data collection. This is comparing the 15 mil and the 17 mil application. And again, uh, you can see that the decay rates are, are pretty similar. The initial is pretty similar, um, but they have a low initial retroreflectivity, and so it results in a uh, lower lifespan relative to the minimum retroreflectivity for uh, restriping and maintenance. I'm going to go back up one more slide. This shows a, uh, a striping age of about a year. Here you can see uh, in comparing the M247 with the P40 rel relative to retroreflectivity, the M247 has an age a, or a lifespan of about 13 months before it hits that threshold, uh, whereas the P40 um, lasted about five or so more months. And so uh, these sorts of things, based on this prediction, is included in making decisions when we talk about that at the end of the presentation. Um, here's white edge line uh, type 3 uh, waterborne, and this is asphalt, concrete, and dry freeze regions. And again, it's the M247 versus P40. 
Um, this is comparing the 17 mil with the 20 mil thicknesses. Um, again, nice long data collection range. Um, the initial values for the 17 and 20 mil were pretty close. Okay, for the M247, uh, um, it hit the threshold somewhere between 20 and 24 months from the uh, predicted decay. Uh, for the P40, it was about 14 to 15 months versus just beyond the data collection range of 20 months. And so for these, the, init the initial retroreflectivity is very similar for the 17 and 20, and the decay rate in the 17 mil is slightly higher. For the white edge line type 3 in Portland cement concrete pavements, we now move to the Aberdeen test section and comparing the M247 with the Iowa blend. Uh, you'll see the data collection range has been reduced to 12 months here. This compares the 15 and 20 mil uh, areas of application. Um, and we can see that the initial retroreflectivity of the 20 mil is going to be slightly higher, and the decay rate for the two is almost the same. For the white edge line, the type 3 waterborne in Portland cement in the wet freeze region of the 15 versus 20 mil, uh, for the M247 versus the Iowa blend for 15 and 20 mil again, and also noting that the uh, data collection range was shorter. And then I think it's worth mentioning, if you want to see the uh, amount of data that was collected, all of the data is plotted and shown in the appendix of the report. So if you'd like to download the report and see where all the dots are on these plots, you're certainly welcome to do that. And so for this one, in terms of initial retroreflectivity, the 20 mils is higher. And then the decay rate of the 20 mil is slightly higher than that of for the 15 mil uh, for this particular combination of materials. Now, I inserted this kind of in the, in the middle of all of these plots to break it up. So if, you know, if some people are, are not interested in the plots, I can understand that. But here's something that came from this is we were interested in... Um, are the dry paint thicknesses uh, resulting from what the DOT wanted? And so from the wet paint thicknesses, we back calculated what the dry plate thicknesses should be. And then we compared them to the actual uh, thickness. And so if you look at the specified wet paint thickness on the horizontal axis, to the calculated wet paint thickness on the vertical axis for type 2 and type 3 waterborne paint, it looks like the paint thicknesses are thinner than what is wanted out in the field, meaning the applied thickness is thinner than what we want for the final product, which is the dried thickness. And so uh, this will be a conclusion that we draw from this that uh, it's something to look at to make sure that everybody's getting the the dry paint thickness that they want by measuring the wet paint thickness in the field at the time of application. So back to the uh, 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 the various combinations of this. Uh, this is showing the effect of reflective element. And so this is M247 versus P40 uh, uh, with waterborne paint. And so this is comparing the white edge line on all of these, comparing type 3 and type 2, type 3 being on the top and type 3 being on the bottom, and then comparing 20 mils and 17 mils. Um, in the upper left, it's asphalt, concrete, and dry freeze. So you can see an initial, uh, the initial retro reflectivity for the M247 is higher. However, they end up at the uh, 100 retro about the same at 24 months. Moving on to uh, AC and wet freeze in the upper right. Uh, something similar there. However, uh, if you look at the uh, decay rate, it's lower. And so an, an average uh, striping life results from that on the bottom left. Uh, that is a type 2, 17 mil, and it's inlaid. 
and you can see the variation in the data collection there. So for the M247, uh, a much longer data collection range than from the P40. So something happened there. I'd have to go back to the report to figure out what happened. Um, and then it's AC in dry freeze, and then the lower right is AC in wet freeze. And so you can see the variation there in the both initial and uh, decay of the retroreflectivity for those materials. And then in regards to the effect of uh, reflective element, the M247 versus the Iowa blend in waterborne paints, uh, this is a comparison of the wet edge, or the, I'm sorry, the white edge line on the uh, both left hand, uh, type 3, they're both 20 mil. The upper one is in dry freeze and the bottom one is in wet freeze. All of these are Portland cement concrete pavements. And then the upper right is a uh, dry freeze region. And so again, you can look at the initial values of retro reflectivity uh, for each of those and how those decay. And so uh, again, the blue circles are to indicate right about where they hit the, uh, the 100 threshold for retro reflectivity. Um, so we can see that the uh, lifespan of, of uh, the white skip line type 320 mil PCC in dry freeze uh, is shorter than the comparison of the others. So then if we look at the effect of uh, uh, reflective elements in inlaid epoxy, so this is white edge line, epoxy paint, Portland cement concrete in the dry freeze region. This is four different types of reflective elements. Uh, that were applied. They all have varying levels of initial retro reflectivity um, with uh, various predicted ages. Uh, now, unfortunately, this is uh, the data range is just beyond about 10 months shy of 11 months. Um, but you know, for Portland cement concrete uh, inlaid epoxy, I mean, we would expect some fairly high durability in this or lifelong, you know, long lifespan. Then if we look at the effect of pavement type, and so this is comparing asphalt concrete with Portland cement concrete, and this is the uh, M247 reflective elements and surface applied. These were all white edge line, all type three, comparing 15 mil wet freeze in the upper left, 20 mil wet freeze in the upper right, and then 20 mil dry freeze in the lower left. You can see the variation in both initial retro reflectivity and uh, the variation in decay. And so uh, the difference between the uh, 15 mil and the 20 mil for wet freeze in the upper two plots, you can see they're, they're somewhat similar there. And then on the bottom for the uh, 20 mil dry freeze had some fairly uh, fast, what I, well, it had a increased rate of decay than the other two. And then the effect of winter maintenance that was simply compared between wet and dry freeze regions within the state of South Dakota. These are all surface applied, white edge line. It's type three waterborne. These are all uh, 20 mil thicknesses. What varies is uh, the uh, reflective elements and the pavement type. The upper left is M247. Uh, the upper right is the Iowa blend and the lower left is the P40. Both upper ones are Portland cement. The bottom one is asphalt concrete. And again, you can see both the variation in, in initial retro reflectivity by the red circles and the rate of decay with those. Then the effect of surface preparation, surface versus inlay. And this is all epoxy paint here. And so uh, it's a comparison of the white edge line the white skip line and the yellow edge line. These were all 20 mil thicknesses. Uh, these were all M247 reflective elements. They were all in Portland cement concrete pavements and they were all in dry freeze. And so uh, if you look at the upper left, uh, initial values of approaching 400 with the decay between the inlay and surface, the upper right being the same for those reflective elements. I'm sorry, for the, uh, now I'm starting to get myself mixed up on what we're looking at here, for the dry freeze. 
in the white skip line. Sorry about that. And so again, uh, take note of the data collection range, but you also see quite a variation in the degradation between the two lines. And then finally on the lower uh, left for uh, PCC dry freeze, pretty low initial retro reflectivity and uh, but as far as the decay rate went, it was it was uh, what I would consider flat, resulting in a, a life prior to needing restriping of about uh, 24 months. And then if we compare uh, wet re uh, w excuse me wet retro reflectivity, and this was a blend of the M247 plus the uh, wet reflective elements, and this was in a type three paint. And so this is looking at uh, wet and dry retroreflective uh, measurements. And so uh, this is, again, white edge line, white skip line, and yellow edge line. They're all 25 mil. They're all inlay on asphalt concrete and all wet freeze. And so you can see there's a huge difference between the wet and dry uh, of those. And um, I think that's just fairly obvious. What uh, we found, though, in terms of the uh, wet uh, retro reflectivity, uh, it ended up bottoming out at 100 at a very short uh, range. And so that started to show us that maybe that wasn't the uh, best thing to use in terms of uh, not that's not the way I meant to say it. What I meant to say is that it wasn't as effective as what uh, we were hoping it would be for wet pavements. Then in terms of uh, wet retro reflectivity for the M247 plus the uh, wet reflective elements again for ox, uh, epoxy paint, this is uh, white edge line, yellow skip line. They're both 20 mil. They're both inlay in Portland cement concrete and dry freeze. These tended to be a little bit closer. For the yellow skip line, they had a very similar initial retro reflectivity. Uh, but the one for uh, wet decayed quite a bit faster than that for dry. And then the same thing occurred um, for the white edge line. And so there's, there's all these, uh, and I'll go up one slide, there's all these permutations and comparisons that can be made for these. And so if you're lost in those comparisons, I'll show you a spreadsheet in a minute that I think will bring all that together to simplify it and make comparisons between specific uh, paint types, colors, thicknesses, pavement preparation, and all of that. wanted to show you uh, what a couple of these photographs look like in terms of the macro photography. And so you can see here where uh, how that marking changes with time. And so this is at 2.3 months to 9.7 months. And uh, comparing the, the left, which is the youngest, to the right, which is the oldest, you can start to see some uh, snow plow damage on the bottom, some adhesion failure on the top. I've added some circles there so you can compare what happens with time. And so I think this, you know, it, it it leads to some interesting questions that we can ask, but they're beyond the scope of this study. So here's where everything lies for this, and, and I'm going to take a risk here, and I'm going to live demo this spreadsheet in a minute, and uh, we'll see if I become a victim of technology or not. Uh, but for this, a spreadsheet was developed for cost comparisons of different alternatives. And what we wanted to do is, is compare these materials for on more of a, instead of an upfront initial cost, which is usually done, meaning how much is it going to cost me to add the, these, uh, these pavement materials, these striping materials, and how does that impact my budget for that year? We took the approach that it should be considered for life cycle costs. And so uh, when we built this spreadsheet, we calculated things in terms of dollars per mile per year. And then based on the expected lifespan of that marking material relative to a threshold, then you could calculate life cycle costs, and that seemed to make more sense to us. And so the marking life expectancy was based on the exponential decay models. 
and then a minimum retro reflectivity of 100. And in the spreadsheet, you can adjust what that threshold is. So if, if you use something different than 100 or want to look at some other value, then you can certainly do that. And then the spreadsheet returns, um, it says a caution message. It, re it uh, returns more than one cost message. So that should be uh, plural instead of singular. Uh, when the model's based on limited data, which is a short time range, usually less than 12 months, and other things as well. And so here it says that the selecting the pavement marking materials is based on a combination of materials um, relative to life expectancy. And so that's a life cycle cost. And so here's a still of the spreadsheet. I'll go live over to the spreadsheet in a minute. What I want to point a few things out is we've created a library of all of these different combinations um, with the decay models. And so in this, you can see the, uh, um, first of all, there's a note there that says this error has been fixed. There was an error in there in labeling only, not relative to uh, uh, numbers itself. And that's been corrected. I saw one of these floating around out there that had that. It's been corrected. We can post it to uh, we can post it to the website so you can grab it. Um, it's set up for the various pavement types and paint colors, and you can see line types, reflective elements, and pavement preparation. And then at the bottom, so the sp the spreadsheet is built so you can make three comparisons at a time: option A, option B, and option C. It shows you the degradation equation at the bottom for that particular combination that you've chosen. Um, it shows you the data set age range for these, and in, in, the, in the still that's posted here, it's for 20.4 months. Uh, it tells you what the initial ret retro reflectivity is. Uh, it tells you what the decay factor is. Then it tells you the expected life relative to the uh, minimum standard of retro reflectivity that you've specified at the top. And then if you also look at the top, it also has a minimum R squared that you can uh, specify, and that will kick in these return messages that you get relative to the data. And so for these cost comparisons, uh, you can see they're all type. Oh, this was comparing uh, type 2 and type 3 uh, waterborne paints, all edge line with different thicknesses with the uh, different reflective elements and then the same pavement preparation of no inlay. And so then at the bottom, you see the predicted life expectancy between these various combinations, and then the cost of dollar per mile per year. And so then you can use the life expectancy with that number to come up with a, uh, with a life cycle cost. And we just think that's a better comparison than the initial upfront cost for this. Uh, in the spreadsheet, and I'll show you in a minute, here's the uh, all the data that's in the spreadsheet. So it has all the product combinations, um, the uh, cost per length per time built in for that. There's the equation. There are the R squareds, uh, the age set, uh, with all of the information that we collected as part of this. And then I'll show you where it gets the cost here in a minute. Um, and then here is another still, it looks like. So let's go over to the, if I can do this, share. And I'll share. One moment, please. There it is. Share my screen. So hopefully you can see the spreadsheet live now. Yes, got it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. So here you can see it. And uh, so the way this is set up, it just has a series of drop downs. And so here's where you can select paint types. Uh, and then based on the paint type, if the date is there, then it will let you select the line type. And so here is edge and skip. And then based on that, uh, for the epoxy type two edge line 20 mil, or I'm sorry, for the epoxy type two edge, we only have data for 20 mil, and so that's all that comes up there. And then we can go to retro or to reflective elements, and so here's data that was collected for those three combinations there. 
And so uh, this is a comparison of uh, inlay. Uh, and so then down here, you can see the life expectancy of 54 months and then a cost of $933 of, per mile per year. And that's probably expected because this is epoxy. It's the greatest thickness. And I can't remember the relative cost of the reflective elements for this particular uh, one here. So, you know, I agree this is, this is not a realistic comparison, but I'm just showing you how we can do epoxy with waterborne, uh, with other epoxy uh, and reflective element comparisons. So as far as the calculations go, here's where in a tab in the spreadsheet, everything is stored here. And the intention of this was as we collect more data, these sorts of correlations or predictions can be updated. And as these are updated, hopefully R square for good or bad will go up and it'll be a better predictor of these down the road. And so that's an option in this spreadsheet to uh, change this information as you go along. And so the intent was in regions of South Dakota, as they measure these, um, they could uh, recorrelate and, 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 and update these uh, predictions. As far as pricing goes, uh, here's where all of the costs are entered in here. And so you can see the costs are, how do I want to say it, fairly inclusive. And so in terms of dollars per gallon of paint, it obviously includes materials and labor for application here. And I think it would be easy to modify the spreadsheet if you wanted to include labor as a separate line item from material costs. Uh, but here's how it was. And these are fairly old costs that are in the spreadsheet. And so uh, if, the, if things look low in terms of dollars, this is probably why it is. And so it has the paints, the epoxies, it has the reflective elements in here. Uh, you can see at the time that the wet reflective elements are substantially more than, than standard glass reflective element, or not glass, but uh, the other types. And uh, here were the surface preparation costs at the time of this study. So here's where you can control uh, your costs in that, that manner. So I'm going to flip back to the uh, presentation. And so you've seen an example of this now. And so I come to conclusions and recommendations from the study. Uh, visual rating can be used as a causal qual qualitative uh, indicator, but it's not adequate for assessing any of this stuff. And I mentioned that earlier. Um, the second thing was the back calculated paint thickness was not in agreement with the specified paint thickness. It looks like things were going down a little thinner uh, than what was wanted out in the field. Uh, the decay rates for type 2 and type 3 paints, they're practically similar. And then the initial retroreflectivity of yellow paint was consistently, consistently lower than that of white paint, um, less than about 200 for most cases. And uh, for folks that are more experienced at this than I, I think that might be obvious to you. Um, the retroreflectivity for yellow paints normally deteriorated in less than one year, and by that it was meant it, it dropped out to that threshold value of 100 in about a year. Um, changing the specified paint thickness of waterborne paint resulted in marginal change in initial retroreflectivity and decay rate. And then the retroreflectivity of the M247 reflective elements in waterborne paint was consistently higher than the P40 reflective elements. Uh, it didn't result in a, in a practically uh, better life expectancy, and so that would be age and length there. The retroreflectivity of the M247 in waterborne paint was equal to or marginally higher than that of the Iowa blend. Um, and so that comparison uh, can be used uh, as specifying in the future, but the decay rates of the two were practically identical from that standpoint. Um, changing the reflective elements in epoxy paint, it, it resulted in a noticeable change in initial retroreflectivity where the mega blend was greater than the Iowa blend and that was higher than the mega blend plus 247 and that was higher than the M247 by itself. However, the life expectancies were practically identical for the various uh, reflective elements. 
and then the performance of surface applied waterborne paint with two four, uh, M247 on asphalt concrete was almost identical to that of the Portland cement concrete. Uh, the retro reflectivity uh, uh, deterioration rate of waterborne in dry freeze was in was in general greater than that in wet freeze and and hopefully that makes sense for folks that know about the winter maintenance activities in the uh, west and east river of, of South Dakota. Uh, the retro reflectivity deterioration rate of inlaid was less than that of surface applied. Hopefully that makes sense. The marking is protected from uh, winter maintenance activities. Uh, the addition of the wet reflective elements in both waterborne and epoxy paints uh, it results in a, in a uh, marginal benefit to wet retro reflectivity and that was shown in the, the decays of those. Um, and then the wet retro reflectivity deteriorates at a higher rate and I showed, I pointed out that it was one year or less. In terms of recommendations and implementation, um, one was develop a more robust quality control in terms of actual paint marking thickness and then the application rates of the reflective elements. That was one thing that we uh, did not measure was the, uh, was the actual application rate of the uh, reflective elements, but we thought that if, if we're recommending um, the actual marking thickness, applied thickness, then that should go hand in hand with reflective elements. Um, and then we recommended that the maintenance regions within the state implement a, a full term evaluation study on markings so that those, those data that are collected can be used to update the decay models that we had because some of those times were just too short. And then the uh, spreadsheet we developed combined with other factors and, and that was the engineering judgment that I'm, I'm uh, advocating for and that's just a lot of experience. It can be used to aid in selecting an optimum paving marking material. Um, and so that ends it. I see I finished at least by my clock two minutes early. I, I designed this to be an hour to save time for questions. Um, and so if there's any questions, I'd like to open them up for that. So while we, um, uh, you wanna go ahead and go to that last slide, please. I'm not seeing any questions coming in. Actually, I take that back. Here they come. Here they go, yep. Did the study result in any South Dakota DOT paint policy or specification changes? Uh, not that I'm aware of yet. Uh, one thing that, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this the best, this project ended up going on for uh, years longer than we originally intended just because of finding the, the areas to apply the uh, pavement markings and additionally was uh, working with the South Dakota DOT to explain this life cycle cost approach that we took. Initially it was like, it, you know, it was, well, we do things with initial costs because that's how we budget things and it took some time to meet with them to discuss this. And the final report with the, with the South Dakota DOT was finalized just prior to the MPC report being finished. And so, uh, there just hasn't been enough time to implement that yet. So the uh, question is no, and it's just due to time. Okay. And then how deep did you cut the groove for those inlay markings? That is a good question. Where, uh, I thought it was on one of the slides, but it may not have been. Uh, there were two thicknesses that were used there, and I'm sorry, I'm not recalling those off the top of my head, but they are in the report. And so if you wanted to see what those are, I'm sorry, I'll just have to refer you to the report there, but there were two inlaid thicknesses that were looked at. Uh, the report is MPC 17-341. Um, Chris, is there, a po is there a capability to put a second link on that page? If I sent you the uh, spreadsheet, you could put it there as well? Absolutely, yeah, if you could please do that, and then we'll include the spreadsheet in the, uh, with the, the materials as well. Okay, so that answers the question from Stephen Green. Yeah, that'll become available. Uh, should I continue answering questions, Chris? Absolutely, yeah. So the one okay. there is on the inlay marking? Uh, yes, it says also, did you find the inlay, inlaying the markings was cost effective um, or are you better off surface applying the markings? Here's where the spreadsheet pays off and the answer to that, it depends. It depends on 
obviously, if it's inlay or not, the paint type, uh, the type of reflective elements, and then in your winter maintenance region. And so there could be some situations where surface applying it results in, in lower life cycle costs than inlaying it for certain pavements. And so did we find that inlaying was cost effective? Uh, yes and no. It just depends on the combination of materials that's used in terms of the uh, pavement marking. And so that's, I, I think that's a correct answer to that question. Okay. And I do not see questions out there. And I don't see any right now. Okay. Do you see that one? Uh, it says, does your threshold of 100 for retroreflective rate to any vehicle line recognition, or do you know what is needed for ADS? No, I do not know what, what the ADS line recognition is. Um, if you want, I could take your name and put you in contact with someone who I think would, would know the answer to that with, with the state, our state DOT. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know where you're from, so. He's from North Dakota. Okay. He's our, he's our program director here, so. So the answer is, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. If you could share that information, if you want to just send it to me, I can pass that on as well. You bet, I'm, I'm jotting down a note. Okay. And there's another question there for you. Okay. Would you conclude inlay is the only cost effective choice for PCC surfaces? I would say no. Again, it would depend on the combination. Um, when, when we finished the spreadsheet, we did try and look at some reasonable combinations of materials. Um, and I think I think the question, if it was worded, would you conclude inlay is the most cost effective choice for most cases? I would say that's true, but there are some, again, uh, where uh, uh, surface applied could be more cost effective depending on the paint and the uh, reflective element combinations in, in addition to winter maintenance region. I'm not sure what North Dakota uses in terms of their standard paints and, and reflective elements, but I hope some of these are them and it'll help you answer some of those questions. I would, you know, I, as you and I discussed yesterday briefly about, um, you know, the material and the proper application rates, the material types, the brands, the method of uh, whether you do inlay um, or surface application I think a factor in a lot of this too is, and has to be considered, is the application itself by the contractor, and then yes. as well as the inspection, and making sure that the pavement markings are installed properly, so that you know these, the test environment is, and research is fantastic, but if we want to get the same results and benefit from research, we need to ensure that the contractors are installing it to those standards so that we, we may receive the maximum benefit and longevity out of those pavement markings. Yes, I would, I would absolutely agree with that. One thing I didn't mention is when the pavement markings were applied, um, our uh, researcher from SDSU was there on site to verify that uh, the specifications were being followed. Now, uh, whether or not the same thing happens on the ground relative to specification. I realize that's one question, but we try to ensure that high level of, of installation or high quality that you're talking about there because we realize it was going to be research. And so we were at each and every one of those sites observing that going in, taking the plates. And if we saw any issues, we certainly said something to the DOT rep there so they could say something to the contractor. Any other questions from our participants today? What I'd like to say though is thank you for attending today's TLN event. Visit our website at translearning.org for upcoming learning opportunities and to access our learning management system. In the learning management system or LMS, you will find future sessions to register for. You will find recorded sessions like today's session to reference back to later as well as self-paced modules and online uh, record, previously recorded sessions. With that, uh, I don't see any additional question in, questions coming in. Dr. Jones, thank you for sharing your research findings and, and expertise in this area. Uh, we you appreciate you me. taking the time. And thank you everyone out there. Enjoy and have a safe day.